Hey y'all, welcome and welcome back to my channel. It's me, Kia Simone, and we gotta get into part two of this Real Housewives of Potomac reunion. I know I'm a little bit late, but listen, between the people down to the TikTok with their tinfoil hats, screaming about the eclipses, the apocalypse, and J. Cole apologizing to Kendrick Lamar, I've been crying in the car. I ain't even watched this shit yet. We gonna watch it together. I'ma just get it off my chest and get on through. And I'll tell y'all exactly how I felt about the whole J. Cole apologizing to Kendrick Lamar in another video because I was devastated that that mother I will go apologize after I done got my ignorant ass on the internet to say I believe this motherfucker got the ether gene. I just, Lord, hell. But with all due maturity, I understand where he's coming from and I'll tell you what I learned from it, but that's gonna be in a different video. Let's just get into this. Before we do, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you've not already. Welcome to all the new subscribers. I know it's been a minute since I've been able to get in the comments and talk to y'all and welcome all our new people. But hey, how y'all doing? I hope you like it over here. And of course, I gotta shout out my super thanksers. Thank you so much to Esther Harry Young, Yvette Greer, and Mari Stanley, and on Cash App to Chantel. Thank y'all so very much. I really do appreciate y'all. Now, let me tell you, I ain't even got that far into this reunion yet, and Candace and Ashley done worked my last damn nerve. So they opened this segment of the reunion up with Andy diving into Mia's million dollar business because we trying to figure Y'all, why is your boyfriend from high school that just showed up in your adult life also showing up to your house trying to kidnap your child by he think it's his child, but it's the child that you had with your husband? But why is that going on? Mia acknowledged that yes, that did happen, but she knows her body and her baby. She said she went through IUI, I guess the same thing NECA did that didn't work. She said that's how she conceived that child and she knows for a fact that that is Gordon's child. So the next million dollar question is, well, why does this man still think that that's his child to the degree that he would show up at your house trying to confiscate said child. Now, as they're trying to have this discussion, Candace and Ashley off to the side having their own damn discussion about how they think it's Gordon's baby because the baby looks just like Gordon. Ashley saying something about the child got Gordon's underbite and Candace is saying how, yeah, the child has a strong face like Gordon. Somebody need to whoop y'all strong asses. Karen is the only one with a lick of damn sense. Karen said, I don't know if she overheard the bullshit they were over there saying but Karen piped up to say hey look here let me tell y'all something kids are off limits at any cost I don't care what's going on I don't care what we talking about I don't care what kind of drama we are drumming up children should be off limits and we need to move on because these kids are gonna have to watch this bullshit one day and it blows my mind that you have Ashley who has children with Michael damn Darby and Candace who over here scared to have her because she's scared of what they gonna come out looking like talking about how you know somebody's kids are theirs because they have this feature or they have a strong face. Y'all, I, I, girl, child, I can't even focus on how trifling Mia S is because they over here like, yeah, yeah, the strong face and the dark brown skin and yeah, the underbite. Now back to Mia and all her trifling. She told Andy the reason that this man thinks this child might be his is because, of course, there was some overlap, you know? She got with Gordon and she had an affair with Ink shortly thereafter, but she didn't conceive naturally. She conceived through IUI, so that's how she know it ain't his baby. And for Ashley and Candace and anybody of the like who is saying, well, it has to be Gordon's baby because the baby looks just like Gordon. Well, that man looked just like Gordon. That Ink man looks like a younger version of Gordon, so ain't no damn telling. Mia is saying how, well, maybe Ink is trying to claim the child because he wants it to be his kid? I don't know. Listen, all of that might flatter your ego, but that has to be utterly confusing, dysfunctional, and traumatizing for a child. You mean to tell me the child just in the house trying to read a book and watch a cartoon and a man shows up at the door trying to kidnap him by you, my child? At some point, especially after you become a parent, you have to stop trying to center yourself. Everything cannot be about you. Everything can't be about stroking and validating your ego because essentially your child has become a victim of your need for validation. That has to be what this is because for you to allow some man to show up at your house and disrupt your family structure about, I believe this my child, so I'm coming to take the child. You wouldn't even go to the courthouse. You wouldn't go to the law. You wouldn't go to a damn lawyer. You just show up at my door and try to take the child and you want us to believe you fit to have the child even if it were yours? 
And then for you to turn around and leave your marriage to go be with this man and say, oh, he's the love of my life. No, he's a damn psycho and drama is your love language. So then Andy moves on to asking Karen something about Karen calling Mia a uh, oh, on um, Watch What Happens Live. Karen is making up some whole story about how, I know I didn't call her a hub. You asked me some question about her saying that after Gordon passes away, she was gonna be a hub. And you asked what I thought about it, only for Karen to get around to saying, yeah, I did call her a hoe. Yes, I absolutely was saying your ass was a hoe. And a thing is a thing is a thing. Call a spade a motherfucking spade. Use a hoe. You got men showing up to your door trying to snatch your child out of your home and you understand because there was an overlapping affair. Use a now, Mia trying to deflect, how we get around to telling Andy he's a is beyond me. Andy said, well, now two things can be true. Yes, yes, I am. I do enjoy being a hoe. And that don't mean that you ain't one. I don't know what in the deflection hell is going on here, but you will need to wear your name tag, ma'am. So they get to asking her questions about this whole marriage falling apart because as Andy said, we watched Mia and Gordon at the finale. Gordon gave some speech about how Mia was this great mom and wife and nothing gave. We are separated, getting ready to separate. We talking to divorce lawyers. It gave none of that. So in the name of defending Robin, Andy asked, well, you know, we talk about Robin and her lack of transparency, but we didn't know anything was going on in your marriage. Mia said, hold on, wait a minute. You might call me a hope, but you won't call me a damn lie. The difference between me and Robin is I sat with Robin on this damn TV show and said that me and Gordon was going through some things that I had gone as far as getting myself a divorce attorney. So I was absolutely transparent. Me and Robin are not the same. Well, here comes back up. Giselle pops up to say, well, in that last scene where we did see the shit the fan, Gordon appeared to be quite angry. Do you think he's angry because he's lost his financial footing and you've left him to be with somebody who is more financially stable? Mia said no. She said her getting together with Ink had nothing to do with her falling out with Gordon. She said it just happens to be coincidental timing that it all happened around the same time. Robin said, oh, well, it must have more to do with his age. She said, no, it has more to do with his disposition. It has to do with him being angry and nasty all the time. And all of a sudden lately, he's always rah rah like a dungeon dragon she said he would wake her up all at four o'clock in the morning but he want to have business chats or she get up later in the morning if you leave him to his own damn devices he go and take all the damn money out the bank accounts so and she wakes up to zero damn dollars ain't no way now to some degree i do believe mia that she and gordon's relationship had its own set of issues that was going to cause it to demise one way or another that had nothing to do with an outside relationship but you're also not gonna make me believe that this ink man wasn't waiting in the wings the entire time. Because if this man was comfortable enough to come kicking in your door on some taking, but this is my child and I'm here to take him back, you not gonna tell me. He just popped up out of nowhere and y'all are all of a sudden so in love. It's just so nostalgic. But she said after so many attitudes and waking up with her bank account drained, she decided she had to do what she had to do. Ain't no damn for better or worse around here. So then Andy moves on and he brings up a statement that Mia made at the end of the season where she said she's been sending Gordon money. He said, why are you sending him money? Is he not working? She said, nope. He said, so you're supporting him? She said, yes, I'm helping him. Mm. So Andy brought up a scene from them being in the Dominican Republic. He said, well, now, when y'all were down in the DR, you said that you might have married Gordon for his money. But then you turned around and said that you had more money than Gordon when you married him because of an inheritance. So please help us understand. Mia says, and this is just Mia's story because y'all know Mia be lying. I'm just telling y'all what she said. Mia said what had happened was the year that she and Gordon either met or got married, she lost three grandparents. And through the loss of those grandparents, she was able to get her hands on some cash. Within a year of her marrying Gordon, she realized that he was functionally bankrupt. I just, God. She said they had this big extravagant wedding. They were living this fancy lifestyle. And he shouldn't have been doing all of that. So Giselle said, well, do you feel duped? She said, well, no, I feel like I wish I would have known that he needed help managing all this money that he had. No, baby, it sounds like he needed help making all this money he didn't have. Because what what do you mean he was functionally bankrupt? Either you got the money to be doing this bullshit or you do not. So it sounds like he was living beyond his means. Not that he had trouble managing all this money he had. And I don't feel bad for it. It sounds like the finesser got finessed. 
You thought you finessed your way into some man with a bunch of money who was going to change your whole life. You thought you finessed some man from up under his wife. You thought you had unhit the jackpot and that lady is somewhere laughing at your asses. Andy said, well, speaking of living beyond their means, uh, what, what about they got in the newspaper you being sued about some unpaid rent or something? What, what's going on with that? She said, well, yes, we do have to go to court for that. But the reason that it has not been paid is because Gordon refused to leave. I moved out and I was not going to pay for him to live. He refuses to pay his part. So we go into court. I said, now ain't that some, sh this man come along by, he going to take you out the strip club and left you in the small claims court. This is some bullshit. So Andy moves on to ask Candace and Wendy. He said that your husbands seem to have a pretty close relationship with Gordon. They were hanging out with Gordon a lot. Did Gordon drop any hints to Chris or Eddie about what was going on in their marriage? Well, Candace starts snickering and laughing and Wendy, you go. Wendy put her head down and she pointing about you just go ahead. Mia said, you know what? When all this hit the fan, everybody in this group reached out to me except these two women. And when that happened, I realized that holy sh these girls are not my friends. Now you got to be the slow leak because they ain't been your friends long before that. You were throwing drinks at the lady and trying to get her dragged off a trip a whole season ago. So why you would think she's your friend and she's gonna call you to say, babe, are you okay? Is beyond me. I don't know if it's because y'all was showing each other y'all little pocketbooks, but that does not constitute friends. Y'all just some nasty motherfuckers who happen to be frenemies and coworkers. So here comes Wendy with her speech about, you know, in all transparency, I wanna say this. When Gordon reached out to our husbands, he was there to annihilate you. He called you everything but a child to God and Candace on the side. Yeah, yeah, it was horrible. It was vicious. Mia said, well, if that's the case and it was so vicious, why wouldn't you reach out to me and say, are you good? Wendy said, well, let me make my point where we left off last season. You had physically assaulted me. So I could have taken this opportunity. I could have said, this is my lick back. Robin off to the side saying, wait a minute. Yeah, they had this whole assault thing. But didn't they end that trip bumping boxes? I don't understand. And I'm telling you, that's where I lost it for everybody on this show. It was at that point that I realized all of them are absolutely foolish. Wendy said, but because of the woman that I am, I haven't said anything about what he said about you until today. She said that goes to show that even though we may not be the best of friends, there is a level of love and respect that I have for you. Wendy, that's not about having a certain level of love and respect. It's about, I don't fuck with you. So I really don't give a fuck what you're going through. No, I'm not going to reach out to comfort you or ask if you're okay. Because I don't give a fuck. Like, just say, I don't mess with this girl like that. You done threw a drink at me. Y'all done had y'all little friends trying to come at my husband and my marriage. Girl, I don't give a damn what you going through. But this whole, no, I do care and I love you and I have respect for you. And that's why I sat at home in my closet laughing at everything you're going through. That just girl child, play with somebody else. So Andy moves on to ask Mia about her living situation. She said she's now living in a small penthouse apartment. Gordon was living in Charlotte, but he's getting ready to move across the street from her or some shit. And Robin. Robin has the sheer motherfucking audacity to pop up about, Mia, can you provide us some sort of clarification about your living situation? Because when we were hanging out, you were saying something about living in Atlanta and I mean in DC and it was, it was just so confusing. So can you clear it up? Can you clear up your entire marriage? Mia said, yeah, I can't explain. I'm syndicated. I'm also looking at Houston. You want to travel to Houston too? mind your damn business. I'm just as ridiculous as your husband. That's the answer. So they move on to get into the Giselle segment and of course we see her recap of the season. Her messing with some young man that ain't her damn man. Her daughter going off to college. Her father getting sick. And when they start to get into her questioning before Andy asked her any questions she wanted to address a comment that Wendy made that was included in her package where Wendy was saying she don't give a damn what Giselle got going on because Giselle was talking about Wendy's mother and calling Wendy's mother evil when Wendy's mother was in the hospital. Well, Giselle said, before y'all ask me anything, let me let it be known that that's a bold face. That's a lie. Giselle said, I didn't know your mother was in the hospital. Nobody told me your mother was in the hospital. When did I make fun of your mother? Wendy said, you said you had talked to Jamal and you said that my mother was evil. Giselle said that never happened. That's not true. Well, here's the problem. You have compromised your own credibility. So now it might be true. It might not. But don't nobody believe you because you're on tape saying shit and then on tape 
denying sh that you said on tape. So Andy is trying to clarify so that Giselle will understand that not everything is a lie just because you call it a lie. He said, listen, what she's essentially saying is you may not have known that her mother was in the hospital, but at the time that her mother was in the hospital, you were talking cash by her mama. And then he says to Wendy, and she's basically saying that she didn't know at the time that she was talking about your mama, that your mama was in the hospital. Wendy said, I don't give a damn. She was talking shit about my mama, period, end of statement. So Wendy is saying we all need to just respect each other's parents. If we talking about having respect, Giselle is saying, yeah, we need to stop lying because that's a bold-faced lie. Well, Giselle, you a bold-faced lie. So nothing you say at this point really matters, nor does it carry any weight. For me personally, it's hard to accept you saying that I never said that and she's a lie when you are a proven liar. And when you lack the authority of self, when you lack the accountability to actually own own the shit you say. You have been proven to be the kind of person that will say severely detrimental shit and then will turn around and deny it. So then Andy moves on and he gets into Giselle's father's passing and gave her a moment to talk about her father's celebration of life. And you know, she's saying how her dad was always very involved in her life, how her dad was the only one who encouraged her to do this show because he thought that she was amazing. And she's saying in general how when it came to fathers, she lucked out, she really got a good one. And of course, naturally, as she's talking about it, she becomes emotional. And we see Candace off to the side with her folded napkin. So Andy takes this moment to ask Candace, well, why are you crying? Mia said that girl cried when the wind blow left. Giselle pipes up and says, yeah, even when it's not about her. Well, just damn. So Candace finally said, well, I'm crying because I feel for her on the loss of her father. I mean, it's it's human. Well, Andy explains that he was trying to use this moment to point out an opportunity for reconciliation. He was pointing out that because Candace is having an emotional reaction, that might indicate that she does care about Giselle and there is some opportunity for them to rescue and recover this relationship, but they kicked that sh straight in the teeth. Just uh-uh. So then Andy gets around to talking about how Giselle has one off to college and two more to go. Ashley is saying how emotional it made her watching the scenes of Giselle taking her daughter to college because we've watched her daughters grow up on this show. Andy is saying how, you know, now that he's a parent, it did hit him so differently. And so that raised the question in regard to a particular scene where Giselle had been talking about her daughter going to Florida to go to college and how she was scared for her daughter because Florida is a foreign country around this mother. He posed the question to Karen about whether Karen should have taken a stronger stance. Should Karen have stood up and said something when Candace and Wendy were making faces at each other and giving little shady looks when Giselle was having this conversation about being scared for her daughter. Karen said, well, let me let y'all know something. First of all, I'm not responsible for nary a grown ass woman sitting around this motherfucker. They responsible for themselves. Now in hindsight, could I have maybe stood up, beat the table a little bit and say, hey, 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 we ain't doing that. That's just not the right thing to do. Maybe yes, yes, I could have. But am I responsible? Should I have taken a stronger stance? No, that ain't my problem. That ain't my responsibility. And I agree, Karen ain't they mama. Karen is a grown ass woman who is in a social group where they are all collecting a check. She is not there to parent them. It's not for her to be running around and, hey guys, that's not right. That's not gonna go over well when they edit the episode. If y'all wanna act the motherfucking fool, act the fool. Y'all get paid to act a fool. Do your job and collect a check. I don't give a damn. Karen said, and to be honest, I've seen everybody make faces about everybody in this group, especially when there is discord happening. And essentially, that's what I believe that moment was. Because Giselle is a stoic person because she does not show a lot of emotion. When she does start to talk about things that make her emotional or she has to let her guard down and show her weaknesses, that becomes the opportunity to side eye this bitch and yeah, she be talking all that. Yeah, don't nobody give a damn. It's an opportunity to demonstrate that we give as little of a damn about you as you give about other people. Now, does it look like bad timing because she's talking about her daughter? Yeah, but that's what I believe is going on. It's their opportunity to give Giselle, they ask the kids the way that they feel she gives hers. But Giselle don't see it that way. When Karen is saying, listen, I feel like everybody has done it to everybody in this group. Giselle said, Karen, don't do that. Karen said, what the hell you mean the man asked me? Don't say, what you mean don't do that? Don't answer the question he asked me. Giselle said, I was talking about my daughter. 
Right. Girl, all right. Why would anybody be making any sort of faces? Wait a minute now. I know y'all sit and film for a long time at these reunions, but it had to be in the same day that you just sat and laughed in Candace's face when she was having an emotional moment. I mean, guffawed, cackled. <laughs> and now you, if I was talking about my daughter, why would anybody? What kind of savage do you have to be to laugh at that? So Candace finally speaks up and says, I regret greatly that Giselle would once again weaponize her daughters to try to make me and Wendy look like evil people. Now, child, just Candace said, I've always shown love to all three of your children. And Wendy spoke up to say, well, what y'all did not see in that scene is that I actually asked Giselle about her daughter going to college. I asked if she was going to pledge AKA. Giselle said, that's a damn lie. That never happened. Andy said, well, I wish we would have shown that. Giselle said, but it didn't happen. That's why y'all didn't show it. Candace said, yes, it did. Giselle said, if that happened, if y'all got the tape, run the tape. Andy is saying, well, they're telling me in my ear that they don't have the tape. Wendy said, what you mean they don't have the tape? Giselle said, that's because it didn't happen. And if it did happen, they would have had the tape. Well, that's not true. I'm not one that believes just because production doesn't have footage, it didn't happen. Because there's a lot of things that happen on this show that we have to see through cell phone footage or some sort of a third party recording. So the fact that production doesn't have it does not mean that it did not happen. Now, is it possible that production edited the scene in a way that all we saw was Candace and Wendy side-eyeing each other and being shady in the moment that Giselle was having this conversation about her daughter, absolutely. However, we're not going to pretend that these women don't have this deep, long-standing beef. We're not going to pretend that they get along most of the time. And, oh, I'm sure that it was probably a friendly conversation. We know that they absolutely cannot stand each other. They can barely get along at home. They couldn't get along on vacation. So I would not be shocked if there was a very limited interaction, if there was very limited conversation or concern about what's going on with your child going to college. Andy said to hell with it, we moving on. I ain't got time. We ain't got the footage to prove nobody's a damn lie and I don't feel like y'all arguing back and forth. So speaking of the youth, let's talk about your little young boyfriend. Andy is asking about the rules of this situation ship and it seems to be that Giselle and this young boyfriend have some rule where basically you just don't embarrass me on social media. What it is, is this is a paid partnership for the purposes of this program. That's what the hell it is. So don't go on the internet making it clear to everybody that you are a paid participant in the bullshit. So whoever your real girlfriend is, keep her hidden from the public because I don't have time for the network, the fans, the nobody to be questioning me. I'm barely holding on to this job and I'm making up storylines as I go. Personally, I don't give a damn. I never bought into the bullshit. We saw that man for one and a half scenes. And I don't believe him and Giselle are a real item. They are playing in our face, just like most of this damn production. And apparently part of the reason this whole line of questioning is coming up is because the man did pop up in the internet, on the social medias, kissing some other blonde woman. And Andy was asking Giselle, did she know about it? And of course she got the same answer for this bullshit as she had for the Robin bullshit about, oh, he called me and told me. So Robin called you and told you when she had your ass in the group chat talking about you, the bloggers. And now this man called and told you when his ass was all over the internet kissing somebody that was not you, even though he's supposed to publicly be your boyfriend. Girl, play with somebody else. Giselle says she doesn't have the capacity to be concerned about what Jason might be out there doing. Girl, just say that ain't part of y'all contract and get out of our face. So then we move on to the Candace segment. They get into recapping Candace's season and they start with Candace is having a clean bill of health because she had found a few lumps in her breast toward the end of the season last season. She went to have them biopsied and by the time that she went to have them biopsy, they had actually shrunk to be too small to biopsy. So she's in good condition, at least when it comes to her health. So they got into her and her music career and she's been touring and she went to nine different cities. Well, in one of the cities she traveled to, she had Drew Sedora from Real Housewives of Atlanta open up for her. And in planning her next tour, she was asked, does she want to bring Drew Sedora back? And she seemed to be a little bit shady about whether she wanted Drew to open for her again. So the viewer question to her was, why did it seem like she didn't want Drew Sedora to open for her? Why didn't she want to bring her back? And she starts explaining to say that, you know, she does business a particular way. 
And if there's someone that she wants to do business with that she knows through a friend, she would go to that friend first. That must not have happened with Drew. Drew must have wanted to use somebody that she met through Candace and she didn't come through Candace to get to the person and now Candace don't want to do business with her. I mean, but it's not surprising, it's true. So the next question was about Mad Dog Michael Darby and him dropping the lawsuit that he had against Candace and how she felt about that. She said, well, of course she's happy and quite relieved. So the viewer question was posed to Ashley and it was, Ashley, you know that you knew what was going on with this lawsuit the whole time. You can sit up there and say you didn't know. You knew what was going on because Michael's still financing your lifestyle. So you was hoping to get some of that money. Yeah, you knew. Ashley came with her rehearsed answer about, well, let's put this to rest. No, I did not know the details. No, I did not stand to benefit financially. I knew nothing about nothing about this lawsuit. Now, the viewer question might have been a little bit harsh, but I kind of agree because I do believe, number one, that Ashley and Michael still a whole damn item. I don't think they even separated, quite honestly. But whether she stood to gain financially or not, I do believe that they were in cahoots. And here go Candace with her simple, just, Candace gets on my nerves. You know, my mom was convinced that you knew too. She, not that I thought that, but I'm just saying, she really thought that. And I had to tell her like, it's okay, mom. So now you and Ashley friends, make it out of our face. So the next viewer question was, now that Michael has dropped the lawsuit, do you think that that will create space for y'all to build a friendship? Ashley answered that shit quick. She said, well, see, the lawsuit ain't never had nothing to do with us not being friends. We was already fucked up before that. Me and this girl never really got along. That means, no, we ain't been friends and we ain't gonna be friends. But of course, in her political correctness, she said, I mean, only the future can tell what's to come between us. Andy said, well, I kind of got a feeling we're going to see some drunk TikToks from y'all in the middle of the night. And I don't doubt it either, but that also doesn't mean that they're going to be friends because that's just what they do. They're frenemies. And they'll do this thing, especially Can Candace works my nerves because she will cry to the public, she will drag on the internet, and then she will go in secret and call herself being friends with them and everything is all copacetic until somebody piss her off and we back to the bullshit and she's crying to the public and dragging on the internet. So then Andy moves on to the fallout between Candace and Robin based on Robin and all her damn secrets and Candace and her internet shenanigans. So Andy starts off by bringing up that he felt like Candace and Robin had a good friendship, what he thought was a cool friendship. And he's saying how the fact that Giselle and Robin were friends didn't seem to affect that Candace and Robin were friends. And Robin said, well, Candace and Giselle were friends at one time. Giselle spoke up to say, yeah, we were friends at one point to the degree that when all that shit went down in season five and Monique came across that table and jumped on her, nobody in this group had her back more than I did. Candace said, no, I think Robin was more supportive at the time because I think Robin called me like every other week. Giselle said, no, nobody had your back more than me. Andy said, well, would you agree that Giselle did have your back at the time? She said, yes, I can say that she did support me, but I do not feel like her support was genuine. I feel like her support of me was hinged on her hate for Monique. Let, let me tell you the truth. Here's the thing. I have found Candace to be insufferable since she got on this show because I remember when she had me ready to ride at dawn on Chris's S because I just knew Chris had called her the N-word. She was crying and carrying on on this TV, but he called her the one word. They agreed he should never call her, and it was a damn princess. He told her she behaved like a princess because she wanted to subjugate him. She wanted to treat him like a servant and not her partner, and he wasn't going for it. Ever since then, I have found Candace to be absolutely immature and insufferable. Having said that, when the whole jumping across the table, grabbing her by her wig, when all that happened, I, who could not stand Candace, was 10 toes down on Candace's side because right is right and wrong is wrong. Monique was dead wrong for what she did. And I believe it was some punk shit because the truth is she was mad at Giselle. It was Giselle who was going around perpetuating this rumor about questions about the paternity of her child. She was mad at Giselle, but she didn't have the balls to go up against Giselle. So she jumped on who she thought was the easiest target. That shit was dead wrong. I felt like Monique was absolutely indefensible and I was 10 toes down on Candace's side. Now, having said that, that does not make Candace 
likable. I get what Candace is saying. I do get that she feels like Giselle didn't support her because Giselle liked her. Giselle supported her because Giselle is an opportunist who took that opportunity to get Monique out of the picture. I get what she's saying, but two things can be true. And while yes, that was an opportunist dream moment. The support of Candace for some people, not all, I'm not even saying most, for some people was hinged on that girl was dead as wrong. So Andy moved on and he brought up Candace and all of her internet shenanigans and all the stuff she was saying about Robin. And he said, you know, he was happy that they were able to get to the reunion where they could break the fourth wall. And he asked Robin if she felt like the stuff that Candace was tweeting all over the internet was coming after your job. Robin said, well, I thought she was being critical of my job and I just don't feel like what she did is anything that a friend would do. So Candace responds by laying out this timeline of events. She wanted to note that this happened after they filmed the reunion on January 19th. She said she saw a picture of Robin wearing her reunion hair. She couldn't quite remember what she texted her, but she knew she texted her something about it being pretty. Robin said, you texted me and said long hair. Candace said, yeah, and you text back something about, uh, Robin said, yeah, and I text you back and said, it probably makes me look more like a white adjacent woman, which I couldn't imagine is a good thing. Robin said, and this text exchange happened after the reunion where she made her comments about Giselle with her white privileged skin and her white looking ass and her tweets online about white adjacent looking women, which all hit me very hard. Candace said, well, let me just finish. She said, well, I understand and I receive that now that those hit you hard. But at the time, my response was, are you mad at me? I, I want to know how Candace was socialized. You don't get to drag people to absolute hell and then text them later and say, hey, your hair is pretty. Are you mad at me? Candace said, yeah. So I texted you, are you mad at me? And you didn't respond. Then I text you again in March when the stuff happened with Juan to say that I'm sorry that this is happening to you. I'm sorry that you and your family are going through this. And you read it and you didn't respond again. She said, so once you had ignored me twice when the whole thing came out about you selling your story behind the paywall, that's when I decided she's on one and I was pissed, pissed. And so I tweeted what I tweeted and it hurt you. And I can apologize for that. So Robin starts by explaining that, first of all, the reason that she did not respond to Candace with the whole, are you mad at me? And her reaching out about what was going on with Juan is because the colorism conversation was extremely uncomfortable for Robin and she didn't know how to navigate that. She said it was bad enough to be on the receiving end of being called a colorist. But then on top of that, when the whole situation with Juan happened, she said, I'm aware that everybody talked about it but it was only Candace that accused me of plotting and scheming. So Candace wants to address the colorism conversation and she starts off by saying that she grew up in a household where conversations about race, color, and the diaspora were commonplace. Therefore, conversations about race are not uncomfortable for her and she made the mistake of assuming that they weren't uncomfortable for the rest of the ladies. Giselle stepped in to say, well, wait a minute, because I don't have a problem talking about colorism. That wasn't your mistake. She said, I went to a black college. I am a member of a black sorority. I am capable of having conversations about colorism. Candace responds by saying, you talk about race and color when it benefits you. Giselle said, but none of this has anything to do with you going on social media and insane insinuating that we were colorists. Candace said, but I never insinuated that you all were colorists. So Mia jumps in to say, well, the question is, did you ever say that they're not? And Wendy speaks up to say, yeah, she did. She said it at the last reunion and they played the clip where Andy quoted what Candace said to production or HR or whoever she had the conversation with as Candace does not believe that her castmates are colorists, but blah, 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 blah. Robin said, no, she said it when she was going off on the couch at the reunion. And Wendy is adamant that she started out by saying that none of her castmates are colorists. She might have started out by saying that, but she also went on the attack midway through her speech. Wendy said, well, if we were to make it a black and white issue, this would be the equivalent of saying, listen, I'm so hurt that somebody would call me a racist. 
But when are we going to have the conversation about why you are perceived to be a racist? So if we're not going to have a conversation about the cause of the phenomenon, let's not have a conversation about the phenomenon at all. So my question is why, when given the opportunity at the last reunion, did Wendy not discuss it? Karen speaks up to say, well, there's no better group of black women on the Bravo network to have this conversation about colorism than this group. Wendy said, well, that's not true because in order to have the conversation about colorism, you have to have the range to have the conversation about colorism. And whether you want to admit it or not, a lot of the women sitting up here don't have the range. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Now, what do you mean they don't have the range? Do you have to have the complexion for the conversation? The question often becomes for me, how does one get to dictate another's experience as Black? How do you get to tell me as a lighter skinned woman that I don't have the range to have the conversation about something that I experienced that you choose to believe I don't based on your own preconceived notions. It irritates me when people think they get to tell one group of black people what they do or do not experience based on what you perceive their life experience to be. Do not assume that because somebody is of a lighter complexion, they are automatically afforded this privilege. When I walk into a room, of anybody who has any level of prejudice, they see a nigga, just like they see when they see someone darker than me. And do not come in my comments with that colorism does only work one way. Light-skinned people can't experience colorism because what happens when the light-skinned person encounters a person of a darker complexion who is in a position of power, who uses that position of power to exercise the prejudice that they have based on this preconceived notion of privilege? So NECA starts asking the real question. She said, all right, well, if we want to have the conversation, what is the reason that y'all are considered colorists? And Robin and Giselle are saying, I don't know, I don't know. And everybody's having these conversations amongst themselves. But that's the point. Nobody is wanting to have the real conversations about the real questions. Everybody is weaponizing some form of victimhood or another. That is what is going on. Robin said, I don't know. I don't know how we get to be a colorist anytime we get into it with Candace or Wendy. Because people are just going to overlook that me and Karen beefed for years. Me and Ashley beefed for years. But all of a sudden, when I'm beefing with Candace, so Wendy, it's because I'm colorist. And I'm sorry, whether you like it or not, that's actually a good point. Because was Robin a colorist when she went running up into Ashley's restaurant on something? I mean, they were some ratchet motherfuckers. When they call themselves busting in this girl's restaurant, putting their fingers in her face and all kind of shit about what you ain't going to be saying about my marriage. So Andy said, well, I guess this is the end of the road for y'all. I imagine there's nowhere for you to go after this. This damn girl, Candace said, well, if this is friendship ending, I mean, I guess I, the worst has been done. Why do you want to be friends with somebody who you believe is a scheming, lying colorist? Man, that's the end of that bullshit. They break for the guys to come to the stage. I just, so the guys come out, Andy greets all the guys to get started. And he starts with the line of questioning with asking Mia about her saying that when she originally got with Gordon, she used to go out of the country on golfing trips with him where he and a group of guys would say that they were going on a business trip on a golfing trip, but they would have all of their girlfriends who, who were secondary to their wives on the trip with them. She said, and now that she's the wife, she's gotten to see the golf trips from the perspective of the wife. I hope he had a damn girlfriend too. Karen looking around at Ray like she might give him a swip and she forgot to give him 15 years ago. Yeah, my, you used to do this. But she remember where she was at and she either got some fresh surgery or she done got her lick back because all she did was turn around and say, I love you, Ray. So then Andy got to Chris, Candace's husband. He said, well, we didn't see much of you this season. Was that by design? He said, hell yeah. Andy said, well, why is that? He said, because if I'm not wanted around, I'm not gonna be around. Andy said, well, is it Candace that doesn't want you around now why Andy playing dumb Candace said no I want him around but when you got a group of women who doing everything in their power just lying and scheming and coming up with all kinds of stories trying to push him away I mean why would he feel comfortable coming around so then Andy asked Chris are you still of the mind that Robin was in on this plot against you and was fake supportive really just to hide what she had going on Chris said honestly you know I don't give a I ain't thought about that shit since last year. I ain't talked about that shit since last year. 
I'm trying to move on and let it go. I wish everybody else would. So my final answer is I don't give a fuck. So the next viewer question to Chris is, some lady came out of nowhere and had some story about she had a whole affair with Chris. She apparently had gotten knocked up and she was going to the chop shop and all kind of stuff. And as quick as she came out of nowhere with the story, she came out of nowhere with a retraction and said, none of that shit was true. I made it all up. And he said, I mean, what was that? How are you going to ask the person who a random person came out of nowhere to accuse. Chris said, I don't know. I'm as confused as y'all. I don't know who that was. Andy said, well, have you ever met this person? Chris said, no, I've never met this person. Robin pipes up to say, so the screenshots, the screenshots weren't real. I, I know you ain't got more questions for somebody else, man, than you got for your own. Robin says, so she photoshopped screenshots of your, you know. He said, I will tell you one more time. I've never met this person. She said, okay, you didn't have to meet them. But I mean, you're saying that she just somehow got screenshots of your stuff. And you mean to tell me you just somehow got the guts to question a man? Robin, where is all this gumption when it's time for you to question Juan? I don't understand. So the next viewer question was, Candace, did you pay that woman off for her to retract that story so quickly? Candace, I ain't pay no damn body off. I don't know what y'all talking about. Here's my thing. Why is nobody looking at Ashley? This screams Ashley Darby to me. I mean, Ashley brought Deborah, who did the same thing. And when Deborah couldn't make her story stick, I mean, it just sounds like something Ashley Darby would be doing. Andy said, well, Candace, you came out and said that you believe that Robin and Giselle were behind these rumors. She said, well, I don't know that to be true, but I am at this point so distrusting of Giselle that I don't put anything past her. Giselle piped up to say that the lady came out on her behalf and said that Giselle had nothing to do with it. She's never known or met Giselle. Giselle didn't put her up to telling no story and none of that bullshit. Don't nobody believe either one of y'all. Y'all are proven, admitted liars. Don't nobody give a damn. So Giselle is adamant that she don't know the lady. The lady don't know her. The lady done said don't put her in it because she ain't got nothing to do with it. Chris said, well, look, you feel like you feel just like she feels like she feels. And everybody is entitled to their own feelings. Just like you said you felt a way about what happened two years ago, you entitled to your feelings and she's entitled to hers. Andy said to Chris, well, you know, I thought that you and Giselle had cleared the air and y'all were in a better space, but it looks like we're back to square one. Chris said, I mean, I didn't say anything. Chris said, I spoke no more on the matter. I left it at the reunion last year. But I do find it very interesting that we like to say that Candace needs to be responsible for her words, but somebody else can say, oh, well, I just used the wrong word and it's okay. Andy just said, oh, okay, and moved on. Yeah, because you don't want that smoke. And that is the truth, that Giselle sat up here and after she accused this man of cornering her into a room and making her uncomfortable that he made her go into a room when it was time for her to face the music, she wouldn't even own the shit. She wouldn't say, you know what? I was wrong and I apologize. She sat up here and lied and denied until she could not anymore because there was footage to prove that she was lying. And there was no line of questioning. There was no, Giselle, you dead, that's wrong. Giselle, you the damn lie. Giselle, you cried wolf and how could we ever believe you going forward? There's no further questioning. There's no further conversation. She just could say anything she want to say and then when the hit the fan and she can't back it up, it's just, oh, well, I misspoke. So they get around to asking the guys about the one husband who is not there. Andy asked the guys, what do they think about Juan not showing up? And all of them, I'm the word, and they struggle, and they show I mean, he do what he want to do. Basically, we don't want to be around this motherfucker either, but we got real marriages, and we got to put up with our wife for real if we don't come, so. Andy said, well, I mean, all of you guys have been the topic of conversation at some point or another. So, I mean, why was it important for you guys to be here to support your wives? Well, still ain't nobody talking up, but Gordon will not be outdone. Gordon said, well, you know, I don't want to throw Juan under the bus, but you see my situation and I would be here for my wife, sir. Just and part two of the reunion came to an end with Gordon getting ready to drop some kind of a bomb on us. He said he's excited to say whatever it is he's about to say. He knows that the fans have questions. The other people on the cast have questions. And he got answers, apparently. I don't know what they are, but we'll find out next week. Child, that's it. That's all. And I ain't got no more. They done wore me clean the hell out. Thank you so much for coming down here, listening to me, and letting me get this off my chest. Please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you have not already. And in the meantime, until next time, just like every time, you know I love you and I mean it. 
Bye.